Ah Ji is an ordinary 16-year-old guy in modern-day China who likes to keep to himself and thinks he's very deep for lying under a tree while listening to Radiohead. In his own words, he doesn't care much about getting good grades or girlfriends and is content living his boring routine life of eating, sleeping and going to school every day. To keep his emo persona intact, he claims he has no dreams, but he secretly relishes the joy of cooking meals from scratch. Ever since he could hold a knife, he has had the innate talent to transform simple ingredients into something delicious. With his parents dreaming, he'd someday become the king of ramen. One day, he makes the perfect bowl of ramen for himself and looks forward to eating it. However, a beautiful girl with long, flowing pink hair suddenly emerges from a portal behind him. Shocked over having a woman in his house for the first time, he drops his ramen bowl. The girl immediately transforms into a cute, mini version of herself and catches the bowl before it hits the ground. She slurps up all the noodles before he can say, Who the hell are you? Refusing to believe this chibi is real, he tries to get rid of her by eating her out the window, even flushing her down the toilet, but she keeps coming back in search of food. She ends up sucking all the food in his kitchen like a vortex to gain full energy, after which she agrees to answer his questions. She introduces herself as Dora, short for Hephaestus, Aphrodite, Athena, Herms, and Isidora. She's a three-million-year-old spirit who's been awakened from her century-long sleep and summoned by Aji with his ramen offering. Her true form is the beautiful woman he saw before, but she uses this convenient miniature form because it saves energy. Unwilling to get tangled up in this mess, he leaves her behind to go to school, but she proves to be a clingy nuisance on the road as well. She follows him like a persistent salesman, promising to make him powerful and wealthy beyond his wildest dreams if he makes a contract with her. She even manages to make him disrupt math class and make the teacher mad, after which he decides to sneak out early when she's not looking. While leaving school, he is approached by a junior who timidly offers him a love letter with trembling hands. This could be the beginning of an admirable high school romance, but Dora ruins it by showing up again, making him burst and yell at her to leave him alone. The poor girl who can't see little Dora thinks he's speaking to her and runs away with a broken heart. That evening, he throws a bunch of snacks at her in an attempt to unsummon her the same way he summoned her. After realizing he wants to get rid of her, she starts crying and says that a summoned spirit that gets abandoned by their master is fated to an eternity of wandering the world like a ghost. She transforms her true form and gently requests to take a walk with him to all the spots that he likes so that she has some precious moments to cherish during her eternity of spooky ghost times. While walking, she holds his hand to show him the world as she sees it. He sees some people glowing with a certain aura as they enjoy what they're doing, like a street vendor who's selling mouth-watering food and an old man who's attracting pigeons by the flock. She explains that everything living and non-living has a spirit and everybody has the potential to summon certain kinds. However, only a few understand the true nature of this world and master the power of summoning and are called summoners. They have the power to do things beyond imagination and have shaped history by playing integral roles. She holds his arm and demonstrates her power by uprooting a tree while saying that they can destroy the world or fix it, if I becomes a summoner. Finally, she directly asks him if he wants to be a summoner and extends her hand to him. Stunned by all this new information, he holds her hand, after which she immediately forms a contract with him and turns back into her chibi version to make fun of him for falling for her trap. Now he's stuck with her regardless of what he wants. As a thank you, she jumps on his back and grows wings to make them fly. At first, it's a magical experience to soar over skyscrapers, and have a bird's eye view of the city, but she falls asleep very quickly due to energy loss, causing him to lose control of the flight. They somehow survive the chaotic fall, but not without getting injured. While tending to their wounds at his house, the lights suddenly go off because he forgot to pay the electricity bill. She holds his hand and says the word fire. A small blue orb of light comes out of his palm and goes up to release many tiny illuminated droplets which have healing properties called glowing light of fireflies. According to Dora, a good night's sleep under these will heal all their injuries. He asks her where she's from, which she tries to answer, but the thought makes her have traumatic flashbacks of ancient warfare, which end with her in inescapable chains. It takes too much energy out of her, and she enters a deep sleep. After that, they sleep together under the fireflies. The next day, Al watches a live basketball game while Dora relaxes on a sunlounger while sipping on an iced coffee. There, they see a news channel report on sightings of a flying man over the city and the mysterious uprooting of a hundred-year-old tree. This makes him paranoid about drawing attention, but she seems least bothered. While he's busy listening to Lincoln Park or something, she gets abducted by a carnivorous plant spirit straight from the Plants vs. Zombies game. He chases after it, but the little bugger is super fast and Dora can't use any of her powers if he is too far from her. Slowly, the telepathic Link grows fainter as she goes farther and farther away from him. He frantically looks around the area, which happens to be the venue for his high school's club recruitment fair. 
He encounters a nerdy boy on a spinning chair who claims to know he is a special person and should join the Supernatural Research Society to be among others like him. He starts getting excited and proclaims they can work together to defend the galaxy. While the nerd talks gibberish, Oz sees a walking plant behind him and jumps over the boy to tackle it to the ground, only to realize it's an innocent girl in a sunflower costume. He focuses hard on their telepathic link and hears some horrible, out-of-tune electric guitar in the background. He recognizes the tone-deaf music and runs to a nearby field to see one of the school bands performing on stage. Sure enough, the link becomes stronger, confirming the plant is around somewhere. Realizing it's hopeless to look for it among the crowd, he tells Dora that he just realized that he spent the entire previous day trying to get rid of her. But if he simply does nothing right now, he'll get rid of her effortlessly. His statement makes her so mad that she gathers the last bit of her strength to beat the plant up from the inside and force her way out. After that, they see the plant hop into one of the female student's pockets, making him realize she's its summoner. It makes faces at them, enraging Dora again, so she chases after them, but the girl disappears with a poof when she reaches her. Dora asks how he knew she was its summoner, to which he answers that she seemed to see both Dora and the plant when normal people can't see them. Moreover, he was keeping track of where the plant was running while he was chasing it, and realized that it was basically running around in his circle. Since spirits need to be close to their summoners, it must have meant that its master would have been waiting at the center of the circle, which happened to be this field. He adds that he noticed the girl wearing black rose earrings with a design similar to the school emblem, meaning she must belong to the rich family that owns the school. Hence, it's best they don't get on her bad side because it wouldn't bode well for him. What's perhaps the most concerning is that the plant spirit was a menace despite her being quite a distance away from it, meaning her full strength must be out of their leagues. The chase was so exhausting that Ah and Dora doze off in his classroom. During their slumber, the girl storms toward the class as everyone excitedly chatters and gawks at her like she's a celebrity. She walks straight to his desk and wordlessly slams a letter with a black rose on it, waking them up. The other guys in the class open the letter before he can and cheer him on after reading the letter, which says she'll be waiting for him in the woods after school. Two love letters in two days? What a W Chad. After school, Ah becomes the subject of admiration and jealousy and is followed by a group of guys all the way to the woods. However, once they start entering the depths, the other guys get trapped in magical vines. Ah and Dora seem to hit a dead end until the trees suddenly bend to clear a path that leads to a clearing. Once they walk to the end, the annoying plant spirit demands him to hand over Dora to them and scram. As soon as he refuses, the girl plucks a black rose and throws it between them like a dart, grazing his cheek. The plant spirit laughs and elongates into a whip the girl wields as a dangerous weapon. Dora leaves Ah to deal with her swings while she looks for the weapons she had hidden. He barely manages to escape the vine whip and the rain of leaf bullets when she busts out a sentient tree. Talk about overkill. The tree shifts its attention to Dora and chases after her, trying to squash her like a roach. Eventually, a pair of vines shoot out of the ground and tie her in place for the tree to crush her, but Ah slides under its palm to protect her. They both appear to have become past tense, but suddenly a golden circle gets engraved on the tree's palm, and they emerge out of the hole with a cleaver each in their hands. The tree tries to punch them, but Dora and Ah create a giant crystal fist to retaliate. Then he climbs up the tree's arm and uses a pair of crystal knives to make paper out of it. The tree gets defeated, and a girl sends it to tree heaven. Dora sees she has her back turned to them and goes to attack her, but Ah blocks her, saying he doesn't want to become a murderer, and that the girl has been holding back so she shouldn't underestimate her. He points behind Dora, making her turn back and see even more sentient trees waiting to pounce. The plant spirit says he passed the test, but Dora hasn't. Understanding her place, she abruptly changes her tone into a cheerful one and tries to become the brand ambassador of peace. She offers them a free ramen meal cooked by Ah, which makes the plant spirit snap because he doesn't want them to insult his master by thinking of her as some glutton. But the loud hunger pang noises from her stomach speak for themselves. All of them go to his house, where he cooks up a delicious feast for dinner. The plant spirit happily shovels food into his face and apologizes for the fighting, saying it's a common practice among summoners to understand their peers' motives since there are good and evil ones. Let's call the plant spirit Bob because we're on friendly terms now. So Bob is about to congratulate them both for passing the test when the girl shoves a chicken drumstick into his face and walks out of the house. A follows and stands beside her when she finally introduces herself as Hana. She says that even though she feels she knows his character, she isn't too sure about Dora and so will keep watching them 24 7 until she is. After that, she gives him another black rose and leaves. The next day, the school and the city around it get overrun by swarms of wild animals. The students, including Ah and Dora, frantically evacuate and Dora encourages Ah to get to the bottom of this, as it's a summoner's duty to step up in such scenarios. 
They see a journalist on a big screen reporting that all the animals in the city zoo have escaped and spread out into the city, causing an emergency where all citizens must go to the nearest shelter for safety. Ah sees a blonde girl with cat ears and a green hoodie walking in front of a horde of animals and gets her out of the way by tackling her. She looks annoyed at him but then gets surprised when she realizes he hasn't figured out she's behind this incident. She gets up and hugs the animals when suddenly explosives hit the ground around them. Hannah and Bob arrive at the scene to restrain the animals and interrogate her about her motives. She defiantly states that animals have always been around. And it's the humans who suddenly took away all the land, so it's the humans that deserve to be caged. Why am I rooting for this cat girl? Anyway, she takes cat fighting to another level when she uses her magic to grow razor-sharp cat claws to fight Hana. She dodges Hana's vine whip with the prowess of a stealthy Chia, but one of her legs eventually gets caught, after which Hana swings her into buildings. She emerges out of the rubble even angrier and runs to her on all fours, using eyes of eagles to maneuver around her whip and uses the speed of a leaper to give herself momentum to jump high into the air and turn into a mighty bear. Hannah pulls out the big guns by summoning a sentient tree to face the bear. At first, they seem evenly matched, but Hannah pulls another trick up her sleeve by using Bob to grow two more arms on the tree. The tree floods the bear's midsection with punches, sending it flying toward Ah and Dora, who chosen to spectate and provide insightful commentary. Before the bear falls on them, it bursts into green matter, which reforms into an aggressive pack of wolves. The wolves overwhelm the tree due to their sheer numbers, causing Hana to receive a few scratches, but she manages to hold them off by growing spines on the tree's bark. The wolves transform into a giant serpent which roughs up Hana even more, causing Ah to worry that both girls will die if they keep this up. He and Dora finally interfere and tie the snake and tree up in soul shackles while he yells at the girls to stop fighting. The snake transforms back to the cat girl, after which Ah claims he solved the summoner and spirit question. He realized that the cat girl isn't the summoner, but it's actually a spirit and that the summoner is a little kitty cat, with a cute crescent moon pattern on her forehead. He doesn't know why she caused all this commotion, but he knows she must have her reasons and immediately tends to her wounds. The cat starts crying and thinks that he hasn't changed since the first time she met him. She has a flashback to the time when she was gravely injured and Ah was the only human kind enough to treat her wounds despite her trying to bite and scratch him many times at first. After that, he gave her the name Mao. Very creative, I know. An argument breaks out over the cat, with Hana and Bob demanding the hand over the cat, while Ah and Dora refuse to, saying the danger has been quelled and the summoner has been subdued, which leaves no reason to go after the cute Nako. Bob tries to persist, but Hana sternly states that Ah is making the wrong friends and enemies and walks away. Ah takes Miao back home to rest when the Catro spirit comes out and tells them about how every animal has the potential to become a summoner, and the best summoner she knows is her brother. However, the last time she saw her brother was when he left her to get some milk, just like her dad did. She'd been following his tracks ever since, which led her to this city. By the time she reached here, she had lost her summoning powers because of all her injuries, but Kind Ah helped her recover. After returning to her full health, she created this huge scene as a way to draw her brother out since it seems he's avoiding her. Ah pets her head and reassures her that he'll nurse her back to health this time too, and that her brother will come back to her eventually. The next day, Ah basically gets swayed by a group of bald, gray-faced men who've come to forcefully escort him, Dora, and Meow to their master's residence for dinner. They're boarded into a Rolls-Royce helicopter and taken to a giant, lavish manor where Hana and Bob are waiting for them at the landing pad. As they walk toward the entrance, they notice many kinds of spirits doing different jobs, like electric eel spirits functioning as electric fences, and Edward Scissorhands-like spirits trimming the garden hedges. To their shock, Bob points out that all these spirits are controlled by a single summoner, the master of this manor. Once they enter the grand foyer with twin staircases, they are awestruck by a large marble statue of an angelic woman. Bob explains that it's a statue of the first leader of the Watchers and is considered a goddess. They climb up the stairs when Ah feels a tingling sensation and has the odd feeling that the statue is looking at him. Suddenly, a gentle female voice calls out his name and keeps calling it. He gets transported to a beautiful scenery with lavender skies and a sprawling meadow as far as the eye can see. In the distance, he sees a tall tree under which stands a woman with long flowing hair and a white dress. She calls out to him with the same voice and waves at him. He extends his hand as if he wants to go to her. But Dora snaps him back to reality. They enter a room where an old man with snowy white hair and a cane stands in front of a window. He turns around to greet them and introduces himself as Harlan, the head of the Black Rose family. Ah and Dora mistake his welcoming nature to mean he's a gentle old man, but he very quickly dominates the space by using some invisible force to make them all sit, while charmingly telling them to make themselves comfortable. 
He's called them to discuss some things, but first he'd like to educate them about the full context through means of a magical PowerPoint presentation with sick animations. All things have spirits, and it is said that the source of all spirits is a single crystal. Of course that means if a person possessed the crystal, it would have unimaginable power. Since ancient times, summoners have been divided into two camps, the Watchers and the Destroyers. The Watchers embrace the philosophy that nature understands what's best and lets it run its course while protecting the balance of the world. On the other hand, the Destroyers seek to take over the world and snatch up all summoning powers through whatever means necessary including homicide. All summoners must choose the cause they will fight for. Finally, he directly asks Ah which side he wants to be in. He doesn't seem to take his question very seriously, so Harlan brings up his personal history. He reveals that he knows his parents abandoned him when he was five years old without leaving a trace. He was raised by foster parents until he became old enough to live on his own. He actually has blonde hair but keeps it hidden by regularly dyeing it black. He has two part-time jobs to make ends meet but still manages to be a model student. So even though he puts up a show that he doesn't care about the future, he's working harder than his peers to secure a good one. He asks if he's ever considered the possibility that his parents' disappearance and Dora's summoning could be connected. Dora doesn't believe this old man at first, but after looking at a family photo in Oz's wallet, she sees Kit in with blonde hair standing next to his blonde mother and father, whose face has been torn out of the picture. Harlan also reveals that he knows Mal is looking for her brother, but since his disappearance, he's become one of the most wanted criminals in the world by acting as one of the Destroyer's dreadful assassins. This subject matter turns out to be too heavy for the guests, so Harlan grants them a stay at the Black Rose Manor for a few days to think clearly and make up their minds. Finally, dinner is served. However, before they can even dig in, they're invaded by a destroyer. Harlan immediately gets into action, and the fight destroys most of the manor. He tells the others to evacuate, but they don't get too far before they're attacked by another destroyer with guns. Mao nemesis her brother in the distance and transforms into her spirit form to talk to him, but he doesn't say a word and attacks her. Ah, who sees this, furiously charges toward him with the help of Dora's powers. Still, he gets knocked out cold by another destroyer's spell, which makes him hallucinate himself back in the meadow, this time closer to the tree and his mother calls out to him and hugs him from behind. Dora goes up to him and desperately tries to wake him up. Meanwhile, Hannah faces the gun chick with one of her sentient trees, but the woman has a pair of limited edition jetpack heelys to lift herself off the ground. Another destroyer emerges from the ground and attacks the tree from behind, which gravely injures Hannah and Bob. The destroyer comes out behind her and slits her throat. Luckily, Harlan immediately hears Bob screams and heals her before there's too much blood loss. However, he gets ambushed by three destroyers at once, and the gun freak blows a hole in his head. He sees a vision of sweet young Hannah giving him a flower, which gives him the will to release his spirit at full strength. He unleashes a spell so powerful that it forms craters along its entire length. Unfortunately, the destroyers manage to evade it, and the leader directly faces him with his grim reaper-like spirit. The grim reaper emerges victorious and Harlan drops dead. The leader absorbs his spiritual energy and tells his followers to spare the others because they'll be useful later. In an instant, they disappear, leaving behind the once beautiful Black Rose Manor in utter ruins. The next day, Ah and the others recoup in his house. The annihilation of the Black Rose Manor and the disappearance of the family makes front page headlines all over the country. Bob works tirelessly to heal Hannah, who hasn't awoken since the lethal wound. Dora is the only one pumped up to take down the destroyers right away, but Ah points out that they don't stand a chance at defeating them if they face them head on at their current power levels. Instead, they should take some time to gather information and think of a good plan. He shows them a video posted online of the battle between Harlan and the destroyers, which someone streamed the entire length of through satellite cameras. He looked into the account that uploaded it and found that her name is Stan and her feed is full of summer related articles and updates. She even has a comic called The Most Summoner. The portrayal of summoners seems very accurate, so she must be one too. As an observer in the sky, she must know more than they do and might be their best lead to find out more about the destroyers. Ah thinks they should meet her at her book signing event happening that day. Nobody shows up at her book signing, causing her to feel like a failure. Ah puts a mask on and approaches her booth directly, pretending to be a fan, while Dora and Meow keep watch, flanking her on both sides. All their efforts to be spies turn out to be flops though because she calls Ah by his name and tells Dora and Meow to come out of their hiding spots. She reveals that she's been keeping an eye on them for the past few days and proves that her breadth of knowledge is vast and not only limited to summoners. The secret to her info mining is her phone which has access to all civilian cameras, police cameras, and satellite feed and can emit a sonar wave that can scan anything within a 300 meter radius. 
Suddenly, an explosion goes off dangerously close to them, and her phone emits an alarm, alerting her of the presence of four threats carrying unknown weapons and heading straight for them. She makes a run for it, and the others follow her. However, their pursuers are like the bullet rockets from Mario Kart, and the only way to escape them is to jump off the flavor. They land in a driverless car, which she pilots with her phone to catch them when they make the jump. The mechanical spirits catch up soon enough and shoot at them. As most summoners says they're the gun lady's goons, but they're fairly low-grade spirits that are easy to take down. However, it appears she underestimated their combat and intellectual abilities because their bullets hit the car's tires. Dora and Mio try to fight them, but they're too fast to land a hit. Stan destroys one of the mechanical spirits, but three more come and attack them at once. A holds the fort down by creating a strong shield, but cracks soon be in showing. In addition to the machine guns, they take out their explosives and shoot missiles at the road in front of them, creating a big gap in the flavor. The car doesn't make the leap and Dora grows crystal wings, but they're too heavy for her to carry them. They're surrounded by the robots once they hit the ground, but Stan summons a truck to run them over. This doesn't affect them much, so she creates a giant robot like in the Transformers and changes her phone into a game console to control it. Hold up is Stan the billionaire that made the Titanic submarine? Optimus Prime one-shots all three mechanical spirits but starts leaking fuel in the process and explodes. The crash causes Stan to lose his blonde wig, revealing that he is, in fact, a boy. Not only that, but he's the nutcase that was pestering Ah at the school's club recruitment fest. He explains that he wears this costume as a disguise as all summoners should to protect their identity. A holds his hand out and invites him to join their party as their eyes, but Stan says he'll need some time to think about it. He takes them to his secret laboratory, which is actually a van covered with stickers of Wafus from video games and shows. The inside is equipped with a lot of high-tech gadgets but also contains many geeky collectibles like comic book editions and action figures. There he shows them how he's been tracking spiritual activity by detecting spirit energy signatures all over the city. Until a month ago, most of the spirits in the city were dormant, and there was very little destroyer activity. However, destroyer activity picked up recently, and it looks like they've been snatching up the dormant spirits for themselves. The Black Rose Manor had almost a hundred spirits, so the attack was probably seen as an opportunity to obtain many spirits in one fell swoop like a spiritual bank heist. Another thing to note is that it seems like all the dormant spirits were awakened on the day on March 17th, the same day a summoned Dora. This can't be a mere coincidence. They go back to the Black Rose Manor to investigate the scene for more clues. Stan uses his sonar to detect remnant energies of the manor's spirits and scans one of the flying camera spirits to look into its memory and reconstruct the crime scene. The first attack came from the sky in the form of an Earth summoner named Ruthless. He guesses they used a portal to ambush aerially and bypass the manor's defenses, meaning a dimensional summoner named Space was also involved. At the same time, the gun chick named Flame also charged in. In his own words, she's a fire summoner and is very mean. Well put, Stan. The fourth destroyer was Crow, Mao's elder brother and an animal summoner just like her. He and his crows are the ideal recons. He asks Sa to recount the moments before he was knocked out. Hearing his account, he guesses that he was mind hijacked by a stealthy destroyer named Dream. The sixth destroyer was like the perfect assassin, emerging from the shadows to slit Hana's throat. Her codename is Shadow, and she is a summoner of illusions. Finally, the seventh destroyer, who landed the finishing blow on Harlan, is known as Hart, and is the pack's leader. He can absorb spirits and people's souls like the Grim Reaper. They slide down to the bottom of the crater that the dimensional summoner most probably made to investigate further. Stan Sona reveals that there was a museum containing thousands of spirits safely locked away by the Watchers, but now they've fallen directly into the hands of the Destroyers. A finds a strange-looking fragment among the rubble, which Stan analyses to find out that it was a part of Ruthless Stone Body. Mao sniffs it and detects the peculiar scent of Red Spider Lily all over it. Ah points out it's a rare flower that only grows in a particular place in the city's surroundings. Stan pinpoints the location to be the stone forest, 300 kilometers away from the city, where a strong spiritual energy fluctuation was detected five hours ago. Despite Ah's hesitation, they decide to go and face their first destroyer. On their way there, they share their pasts. Ah says his father left when he was five years old and a few months later, his mother followed. Since then, he was raised by distant relatives until he was old enough to live on his own. Since then, he lived a pretty normal life until Dora came alone. Dora confesses she can't remember much of anything, and all she knows is that she was alone in the beginning and lived the life of a vagabond. While she wandered, many things happened, and she met many people. However, if she tries too hard to recall the details, her head starts hurting. Stan does a full-body scan of her and shows that her memories have been deliberately sealed away by someone. 
Once they reach the stone forest, they find the skeletons of houses and shops that once were part of a village. Stan explains that it was all destroyed under mysterious circumstances ten years ago. Further inside the forest, they come across a crimson field of red spider lilies in the middle of which stands a house. They take cover among the flowers and watch as a man comes out of the house and starts plowing the ground. Stan notes no spiritual fluctuations in him, indicating he's just a normal farmer. They continue to keep watch as the man does other normal activities until Dora blows their cover after being jumps cared by a rat. The farmer starts waving at them, so Ah and Dora walk up to him. Ah explains that he and his classmates are doing field work in the area for a school project, and that he came by to buy some food for them. The farmer generously pours out tea for him and gives him a large box full of packed meals. He shares he's lived alone for almost a dozen years and is happy to see some new faces finally. A wind starts blowing, scattering red lily petals all over. He says he's the one who grew all these flowers over the last ten years as a way to carry on the lifelong wish of his first love from the barren village who wanted to transform the stony wasteland into a crimson paradise. The winds grow stronger and turn into a full-fledged storm. The sea of flowers is overrun by twisters that destroy the lilies, causing the man to be driven by madness. He transforms into Ruthless, the destroyer Earth summoner. His skin is too thick for Mao's claws or Dora's cleavers, so Dora asks Meow and Stan to buy her some time until she and Ah can use one of her tricks. Meow initially has the upper hand due to her speed, but he grabs her once and slams her on her back, incapacitating her. Stan uses holographic projects to confuse Ruthless about his position and narrates his backstory. He reveals that Ruthless' real name is Modio, and he is 26 years old. He suffers from severe trauma in his brain, causing him to have a split personality and other mental illnesses. Ruthless roars, sending strong sound waves that strip away the flower beds to reveal countless skeletons underneath. This explains the cause of the village's disappearance. By this time, Dora finishes loading her memories into awe, including the technique and characteristics of all her weapons. With his newfound knowledge, he charges at Ruthless with a lance, then follows it with a sword slash, a dagger to the chest, and a hammer to slam him into the ground. The hammer strikes his core, causing Ruthless stone armor to shatter and reveal a dazed Manu underneath. He urges them not to kill him, claiming things will get much worse after that. He says that he was possessed by parasitic evil spirits before he was even born, causing his mother to die while giving birth. His father also died a few years later because he was unable to bear the sadness. He was known as a monster in his village and was harassed by the other kids for his strange, stony arm. He often lost control over his body, committing violence against his bullies. Soon he was ostracized by the village entirely and the locals held a trial to decide they'd beat him up and tie him up in the mountains to die. However, one day, a kind-hearted girl named Ahua approached him and gave him food day after day. She always dreamed of growing flowers but would repeatedly fail because of the infertile soils and unforgiving sun. She never lost hope in her dream to turn the place into a sea of flowers. Once he asked her to give her a flower seed, out of which he successfully grew a white spider lily on his stone arm. They spent years of bliss together, but things got worse in the stone village. The locals directed their anger at Muduo, convinced he was the curse that was causing all this misfortune and decided to kill him once and for all. Awa tried to resist, but they didn't trust her anymore and beat them both up. One of the villagers swung his sickle on them, stabbing her in the back. Seeing this, he let out the parasite and the fury that had been boiling within him for years, destroying the entire village. The white spider lily that grew on his arm turned into a red one, and he laid it on top of Owa's cold body. The soil, now enriched with the flesh of the villagers, led to the blooming of blood-red spider lilies. He says that the only thing restraining the parasitic spirit are the chains and core on his body, which were given by the destroyer's leader on the condition that he let out whenever they needed to cause destruction. However, the seal shatters and the parasitic spirit lets loose and consumes Modua entirely. No matter what they try, they can't defeat it. Meowbit's gravely injured and Ah's hammer breaks without landing a scratch. Ah throws the lance into its head, piercing right through, but it simply takes it out and throws it away like a toothpick. Dora tries her best to summon as strong a weapon as possible for Ah to defeat it with a single blow, but even that falls apart. The impact causes Ah to hit the ground hard, and he loses consciousness. Dora runs to his side, desperate to protect him with her life. Her screams of plea resonate within Mudio, who is reminded of Owa protecting him, but the spirit still lands a strong blow. Meanwhile, Ah sees himself transported to a realm with a crystal at the center, shackled in chains. Upon touching one of the chains, it disappears. Next, he touches the crystal, which causes Dora to be surrounded by a crystal. Within it, she gains the power to summon a ram of thousand swords, which finally pins the spirit down. She emerges from the crystal with large crystal wings, red hair, completely black eyes, and a pair of horns. 
She descends a giant blade from the skies called the Judgment of Heaven, which completely obliterates the Earth's spirit. After that, she returns to her usual chibi form and checks on Ah. After he regains consciousness, they check on Moduo's body to confirm he's dead. Stan is bummed they've lost their lead, but Ah states they don't need one anymore because the destroyers will hunt them down after this incident. They get away from the scene in the Stan van, but Ah and Meow are still out cold due to their injuries. However, they don't have the time to recover before Stan's phone alerts him of massive spiritual energy fluctuations. A shadow blade splits the van cleanly down the middle, throwing all of them outside to the mercy of the destroyers. Flame shoots Stan and Meow in the head. Ah tries to raise his head to look at them, but all the destroyers stand in front of him, blocking his view. He's unable even to get up, so the Grim Reaper picks him up and tosses him into the sky, and Space deploys a space cutter to chop him up. His eyes close, the last thing he sees being Dora staring at him with terror. He awakens in another dimension, where he sees multiple glass shards floating around in space. A heavily cloaked and hooded man walks toward him and shows him the tragic fate of his teammates in one of the shards. You guessed it, they're all dead and Mr. Hart sucked up all their souls. Ah breaks the glass shard into pieces and yells in despair that it's his fault that he wasn't strong enough to protect them. That's when the man offers to return him three minutes back in time for another chance at salvaging them. He removes his hood and Ah immediately recognizes him as his father. His father reassuringly passes back and tells him he is waiting for him to come to the demon furnace, once all this is over. Ah finds himself back in the van, but this time he wakes up and is on high alert. He tells them everything that will happen and what they must do in rapid-fire mode. Once the destroyers teleport to the van and Shadow slashes the van apart, they are shocked to see nobody there. One of the mattresses is strapped with a ticking bomb which explodes seconds after. They know their vehicle switcheroo won't buy them a lot of time, so they get to Oz's house as quickly as possible to take Hana before they get their hands on her. However, she's already gone once they reach. There isn't any sign of violence, and Ah finds a letter and a black rose left by her on the bed. Stan alerts them that the destroyers are a mere two kilometers away from the house, so they flee with Hana's helicopter in stealth mode. Ah opens her letter to see messages left by her and Bob, which are essentially the same. They are waiting for Ah at the Demon Furnace. Are they expecting to have a whole cast reunion there? Mao says that while looking around for her brother, some people said he had been to the Demon Furnace. Stan knows about it and states that it's an ancient holy arena for summoners, where they undergo trials to transition from apprentice to a full-fledged summoner officially. He gets very hyped up while explaining that there are long-standing rumors that countless mysterious and priceless treasures are hidden in the depths of the furnace. Alas, he has not been able to go yet because he has no idea where it's located. Fortunately, Omnibus is a set of coordinates in the letter, which Stan confirms should be the correct location. It's 7,000 kilometers from their current location, so if they head to it immediately, it should take them 7 hours to make the journey. They all get energized to have a fixed goal and make preps to reach full steam ahead. Seven hours later, Stan wakes them up when they arrive. The first thing they see outside the window is a massive, angry hurricane over the turbulent sea. Stan points out that this place is called the Sea of Death because many ships and planes have crashed at this site. The entrance to the dungeon furnace is hidden somewhere here. The helicopter gets violently tossed around by the hurricanes until, all of a sudden, everything becomes calm. Stan joyously declares that they've made it past the gate and entered the dungeon furnace. Below, they see a beautiful clear blue sea and a chain of small islands. All of them look out in admiration except for Ah, who looks around them all tensed up. Suddenly, a portal opens inside the helicopter and Shadow Blade emerges out of it and immediately attacks them, but Ah blocks her with his holy shield. The slash still tears the helicopter apart. Stan resembles the helicopter into a robot with hands that hold all of them. They attack her with Ah's mystic cannon, Mao's claw wind, and Dora's phantom swords, but she gets away. Flame pops up, showers them with a rain of bullets, and effortlessly dodges their attacks. The robot succumbs to the damage and starts crashing down. Crow appears, and this time, Oz's mystic cannon seems to hit its target, but a murder of crows emerges from where Crow was supposed to be. The birds turn into flames and burn the robot. It crashes into an island, but thankfully everybody survives with a few bruises and scratches. Not so thankfully, the six destroyers arrive at the island and walk towards them. Before another one-sided fight breaks out, a girl in a totally normal bunny costume comes in between the parties. She introduces herself as Bonnie, the administrator, and issues them a final warning because they committed 12 rule violations of the island, including but not limited to reckless flying, environmental pollution, and group brawls. Flame points a gun at her and tries to intimidate her, but Bonnie is not impressed and humbles her real quick by saying she's in the demon furnace now. She then proceeds to scold the destroyers like she's a teacher and they're her preschool kids. Since they graduated from here, they should very well know that killing outside the arena is strictly prohibited, and there are no exceptions. 
Shadow gets pissed at the bunny because she has the nerve to talk to her leader so disrespectfully. But Heart stops her, saying they must respect Bonnie because they're in the demon furnace. After that, they all teleport away. Stan and Dora freak her out by clinging to her while thanking her for saving their lives. She kicks them away and welcomes them to the dungeon's furnace. She says she'll be waiting for them at the registration plaza and wishes them luck for their performance in the arena. They have a few questions to ask her, but she sharply turns around and runs in the other direction. They try to run after her, but she's unbelievably fast, and they inevitably lose her. The chase makes them exhausted, but luckily, a traveling merchant named Richard finds them and offers a lift on his giant reptile. Hot graciously takes him up on his offer, and they get on their rides back. Richard asks them how they turned up here, to which Dora answers that they came here to escape from people hunting them down. He says they come to the right place because this island is commonly used as a place of refuge for criminals who want to escape death row, and ensures them that it's a totally safe space. He explains that the Watchers and Destroyers were tangled up in an endless war that greatly cost both sides. Hence, to mitigate further loss, both sides negotiated a ceasefire and created this island, the Dungeon Furnace, as a place to peacefully settle all matters according to its rules. Think of it as a mix between the UN and the Olympics. No wonder the Destroyers just let them go because anyone who breaks the peace on the island makes an enemy out of both sides. Richard takes them to the island's most famous pub and insists they try the owner's secret drink. The bartender asks him if they're newbies, to which he sketchily winks in response. I'm sure this guy only has the purest of intentions. Each of them gets a bottle of a neon green drink, which they gulp down all at once. They all think it's super tasty and refreshing and even realize that all their minor wounds have healed. Richard tells them it's the island's top-class medicinal underground spring water. They demand another round right away. Richard grins because they've fallen right into their schemes because this drink is highly addictive. 75 years later. They drink until they physically can't anymore, and the check comes out to a hopping 230,000 furnace dollars. Richard, a true gentleman, offers to pay for them this time. They tour Furnace Town, a lively town with countless markets, restaurants, hotels, and homes. Less glamorous is the fact that it's also called the Loser's Town because only those who lost at the arena live here. They see a salesman announcing that his shop has the best clothing in town, making R realize they do need to replace their currently tattered clothes. Richard points out that everything they'll find here is low quality and claims all the good stuff is in the black market. He still lets them check the place out, though. Right off the bat, they're stunned by the wide variety of outfits and pick expensive items. The shopkeeper also asks Richard if they're newbies, to which he tells him to bring out the good stuff. He generously covers this 400,000 furnace dollar bill for them, too. He tries to distract them even more, but I reminds them that they haven't come for sightseeing. Richard laughs and leads them directly to the registration hall. It is situated atop a tall hill and is only accessible by a long flight of stairs. He leaves his reptile behind and they climb their way up, all while admiring the breathtaking beauty of the demon furnace. They're filled with a sense of erratic excitement once they reach the entrance of the legendary arena where good and evil meet. They see Bonnie again, who addresses the crowd as the MC of that day's events. She hypes up the crowd by reminding them of their united cause to become full-fledged summoners, and finally declares the day's registration open. Four magical doors open up and Bonnie says the contestants can enter through any of them to register for the event. Oz party goes toward door one, but they're blocked by a guard spirit, who demands a registration fee of two million. All of them are shocked by the amount, but Stan confidently walks over to the guard and makes his payment, explaining that he just hacked a bunch of drug cartel accounts. The rest walk over to door 2, where they find out the eligibility criteria is beauty. Dora transforms into her true form and passes with flying colors, so she and Ah successfully enter. Mao tries her best but fails. I'm sorry Mao, I definitely pass you. Catro's supremacy. She goes to door 3, where the condition for passing is brute strength. Fueled by her recent rejection, she transforms into a mighty bear and crushes the test and gains entry. Richard meets them on the other side by entering through door 4 which is based on reputation. It is an expressway for VIPs, celebrities, and millionaires, so he must be an important person, too. Bonnie guides everyone to a platform and announces they're officially in the Demon Furnaces arena. She says it has 100 floors, the first 20 being meticulously designed competition arenas. The platform starts descending floor down when they meet a bunch of repeat competitors who haven't even gotten past the first five levels. Richard reveals he's a repeater as well, only having cleared nine levels on his best run. Dora loudly proclaims that they'll clear the hundred floors easily in one go, making everyone, including Oz Party, laugh at her. Ah wonders which floor he'll meet his dad in. Once they reach the first floor, Bonnie activates the first checkpoint and explains that they'll come across a new one every ten floors. 
If they lose in any floor, they'll have to start over from their last checkpoint. The first floor is a luxurious hotel that is free for the contestants to stay in. She tells them to relax and have a fun time until the elimination challenge tomorrow and makes her leave. Mao sniffs out the hotel's restaurant and they all storm off to feast there. However, the veterans like Richard stay back because they know the trials have already started. They discuss how this floor's boss is the world's top-ranked trap master who takes pleasure in tormenting the contestants. Meanwhile, Ah and the gang have fun at the swimming pool when they notice a broadcast on the Furnace TV, which announces Hana and Bob as one of the MVPs of the arena, as she is the first to make it to the 11th floor this season. They all cheer her on and get motivated to catch up to her. The foolish amateurs enter their rooms for a good night's sleep, but all the veterans stay put in the lobby. Sure enough, all wakes up in the middle of the night and realizes the wall behind them is armed with spikes and closing in on them. No matter what weapons Dora throws at them, the spikes in the door don't budge. The window is also sealed shut. Right when they're about to get turned into minced meat, Ah tells her to conjure a skeleton key like she does her weapons, and they escape from the room. Meow also escapes by turning into a giant cockroach and slipping through the gap under the door. Most of the other contestants also escape, but Stan is nowhere to be found. Thankfully, he drops down from the vents alive and well. An announcement from the round's boss blares throughout the hallway, stating that there are no rules in this round and their only objective is to leave the hotel alive. The entire area transforms into a giant, sick mouse trap. As they run, some of the floor ahead of them collapses into a pit of lava. They try to escape, but they all fall into the hole. Dora thinks quickly on her feet and uses her crystal wings to save Stan. While I uses the jetpack in his shoes to propel upwards with Meow and others grabbing onto him. The gang runs and evades traps until they arrive at a door with the sign Front Exit but they get confused by all the notes left by precious contestants, which have conflicting messages about what's beyond the door. None of them can make a decision until Ah takes a deep breath and kicks the door wide open. They see a bunch of contestants scattered around a large room and a man with a red clown nose and green goggles at the center. The man claps and reveals himself to be the level's boss. He congratulates all the arrivals for passing the first floor's trials and announces that only 30 passed, 49 were gravely injured and 13 died in this round. Some of the hot-headed contestants rally to beat the clown up, but he electrocutes them and traps them with blocks of heavyweights. Next, he awards all the victors with a wooden treasure chest for clearing the floor. Ah opens his chest to find three crystal shards and a saffron ring, Meow gets 30,000 firmest dollars and half a rough diamond and Richard, unfortunately, gets a pair of mismatched second-hand boots. Stan opens his chest to see a bunch of explosive ammunition and is confused. The boss squeals in delight and announces the unveiling of the jackpot as it is the key to the second floor. Having a hunch about what's about to happen next, Ah creates a holy shield to protect them as the boss sets the explosives off, causing the floor below them to crumble. They make a chaotic and rough descent to the second floor where they are greeted by a creepy ghost. No way, it's just Bonnie. She reveals herself to be the boss of this level and that the challenge is a race. Multiple stadium lights switch on to reveal a giant racetrack. She explains that the first 15 contestants to get past the finish line after completing 20 rounds pass through to the next level. Moreover, this race will be broadcasted live on Furnace TV and commentated by hers truly. Let's be honest, you all would have lost in this round. Ha's party is excited about this straightforward round because Meow has all the speed and agility of a cheetah and Dora has her crystal wings. Stan assures them that he'll also find a way to clear it. Once again, the veterans look down on the newbies because they prepared for this round as well by equipping themselves with shoes that have motors and wheels. The race has a great start with Meow in the lead, but another animal summoner close behind who exhibits the gliding power of a flying squirrely. Dora and Ah are in a comfortable position as well while soaring with the help of her wings. However, a dark horse emerges in the form of Stan on top of a rocket, who jets past all the contestants in the blink of an eye. As he zooms past Meow, he explains he got the ballistic missile from a country's military that just happens to be running military exercises in the ocean. Must be North Korea. Soon, the fastest contestants end up overtaking the slower ones by many laps. Ah warns the others to stay on high alert because the ones that are currently losing have realized they don't need to be fast, they just need to do what it takes to slow others down. One of the so-called veterans becomes a sore loser and starts shooting bullets at other contestants. He shoots at Ah and Dora as well, and they turn out to be special bullets that follow them until they make contact, so Dora flies back to the cowboy so they gets a taste of his own medicine by getting shot. Another contestant releases a mist of highly potent poisonous gas which immediately incapacitates the contestants who run through by causing breathlessness and muscle spasms. Some even go insane and fall down the track. Meow jumps up to the poison summoner and attacks him with a venomous snake. 
Once he's caught off guard, the flying squirrel uses his wind powers to suck him up into a twister. Another six-armed summoner turns the track into a dash and slash by rapidly swinging his swords at anyone who comes close. He's about to kill two contestants who beg for mercy in exchange for their voluntary surrender when Stan interferes by redirecting his missile toward the summoner. The swordsman simply slices the missile into multiple pieces and lands unscathed. Stan is about to be turned into shish kebab when one of his favorite manga writers appears and fights against the summoner with his piercing words that turn into literal blades. Ultimately, the swordsman gets chopped up into pieces. Stan thanks his hero and asks for an autograph. Finally, the race draws to a close because there are less than 15 participants who are still capable of going on. All they have to do is cross the finish line to win. Oz party are still fueled up though because each of them is motivated to win first prize. Meow ends up winning the first prize with a 0.5 second lead from Ah and Dora, the second place winners. The third place goes to Hiro, the famous manga artist. What a multi-talented man. The destroyers were forbidden by their leader to take part in the arena. Watch all this unfolding on Firmus TV. The third floor challenge is a cooking competition. Ah breezes through with a dish so mouth-wateringly delicious that the judges think they're on food wars. Meow thinks outside of the box and prepares a lavish bowl of fresh fruits and veggies which livens up the spirits and Stan makes the best dessert with the help of an ice cream making robot. The fourth floor challenge is a carry of challenge which serves as a respite from the hectic trials of the previous floors. The loudest contestants win which in this case is a crying baby who defeats an electric guitarist. Makes sense. As the destroyers watch this baffling spectacle, Flame gets so triggered that she fires three bullets at the TV because she thinks they're having it too easy. At the same time, Hart, the leader, walks in and they try to explain away what they were doing. However, the leader understands their anger over seeing their enemies having fun at the Demon Furnace Arena while they simply have to sulk around. Moreover, he realizes Space, Flame, and Shadow have never participated, so he grants them permission to attend for a week and give Oz party company, provided they agree to take along a scary-looking figure with glowing eyes wrapped up in a straight jacket. He tells them to tell Awe on his behalf that he brought him a special gift. Meanwhile, Bonnie gives the higher-ups a rundown on the current arena event, saying that there are 15 contestants out of the total 92 of this season's Group 7 that made it to the fifth floor. She adds that all the competitions so far have resulted in the collection of 30,000 tons of spiritual energy. The higher-ups are happy to hear this and decide it's time to start the sacrificial program by activating the teleport gate that will lead all the contestants to the Demon Furnace, 100 floors down. Bonnie enters another grand room where a giant unconscious woman wrapped up in chains hangs from the ceiling. She respectfully calls her the goddess Pandora, the source of all spirits, and presents her with some spiritual energy as an offering. She ominously says that if they can finally successfully rouse her from her deep slumber, all that they've done at the Demon Furnace will have been worth it. The story has just begun. 